Okay, let's get started. So let me start with just some announcements and some overview of things that are going on. Okay, so um, today recitation. You're gonna get a handout, which will be your written homework for Monday. Okay, it it could be argued that <clears throat> it's the most important homework assignment of the semester. Okay, it's all uh, a lot about the fundamental theorem applications. So crucial assignment. Okay, so recitation, handout, due Monday in class. Okay. And then uh, also Monday, there's my math lab due. I posted that this morning. Okay, that, per, uh, that pertains to what we'll do in class. Now, we, um, can I have your attention, please? Okay, and then so, so this my math lab is about, uh, this my math lab that's due Monday is about area, which we'll talk about today in class. Okay, and there's also the, these undoing the chain rule. Okay, we'll do a couple more examples of the undoing the chain rule type antiderivatives. So I just want to kind of throw it out there. Do you want a my math lab maybe due in the middle of the week next week to help your grade, or do you want me just to post that for practice? Because it is on the final, this undoing the chain rule kind of technique. So the question is, do you want another my math lab to count to help your grade, or do you want to just have review problems? Review problems? All in favor of another assignment for a grade? My math lab. Oh, that was easy. Okay. So then there'll be a my math lab. When do you want it to be due? Wednesday? Reading day? Let's say due Wednesday at 5 p.m. Okay. Monday we will have class. Of course, you're handing in this written homework. Yeah. Will we only have the two tries or will we have like more so we can maybe understand why we're missing it? Um, well, so the, pr the problem with more tries is people just start guessing and they don't want to think about it. So um, I'll go with two and then I can, I'll post another set identical to it that has unlimited. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so my math lab number one, due Monday, and then there's a, will be another one will be due Wednesday at five. Okay. Um, What's next? Wednesday, I have reserved a room from 11 to 2 for just a study session. Okay, I won't have anything prepared to present to you, but our final is next Thursday. Okay, so 11 to 2 in ECA 225. This is come and go as you please. You don't if you you can come at noon. You can come at 1:30 if you just have a couple questions, whatever. Or you can come and study and work the whole time from 11 to 2, and I'll just be there to answer questions. Study in groups, you know, work together. Um, so that should be a study session. That's right across the hall from my office, those who have been to my office. Okay? And then uh, Thursday night is our final. No. I will post, um, I, I'll post an announcement with all the details, but it's Thursday at 7 p.m. I'm pretty sure it's an SCOB, but don't hold me to that. So final exam, so... Uh, Blackboard announcements. I'll get that up soon. Okay, but know that your final exam is Thursday at 7. Today I will post the comprehensive review sheet for the final exam. Okay, so I will post that 
along with the second My Math Lab. The first My Math Lab is up and running, and Owen has your handouts for recitation that you'll do Monday in class. Okay, so questions about... So Monday we'll do a little bit, we'll do a, some more on area and, and talk about some questions from that handout, which is, a like I said, critically important assignment, kind of bringing together everything we learned all semester. <clears throat> Questions about the, the game plan for the next week? Less than a week to go. Less than a week to go. Um, yeah? Is and Owen's office hours going to be the same next week? Um, so do you have an office hour Monday or Tuesday? So you're done then. So Owen's done. Mine will be the same on Tuesday. Okay. But then Wednesday's reading day and okay. all bets are off. But please schedule an appointment with me if this doesn't work for you. So Wednesday. And then I may have... I'll probably have a last chance office hour on Thursday during the day also, okay? I'll just, I'll let you know what that is. Other questions? Okay, so for Monday, remember you got the handout you're getting in recitation, due in class, and a math, my math lab that's up and running. And then there's one more assignment due Wednesday. Last chance, questions about this kind of stuff. Okay, Beth, make sure you get all this information. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about undoing the chain rule. So let's go back. Okay, so here's one, and let's, I'm going to rewrite it larger. So remember what, what's the idea, is that if you have a chain rule derivative, what's the form? So if we got a composite function, and we take the derivative of it, what does it look like, the derivative? F prime of G times, so we're on the lookout for this kind of thing, the antiderivative then will be collapsing this product back into the original composite function. That'll be the antiderivative. Okay, so which is what do we focus on in order to do that? Do we focus on number one or number two? We focus on number one because all really all there is to it is to to realize what the structure is and do what. So the structure is the f function, and what are we going to do? Take the derivative. Agree with that? We're going to take the derivative of that. So, I mean, the derivative of g would give you g prime, but we got to take the antiderivative of f. Right, so you're going to look for the overall structure, and you're going to do antiderivative of f, and what's going to happen to the inside function? The Leave it the same, and we basically got it, then we just got to clean up the mess, right? So, there might be a little factor that we have to figure out. But that's the point that you're just going to find this part and look at the overall structure and do the antiderivative of the overall structure. And you've basically undo undid it. So now here's one that's a little different looking than how are we going to handle this? Because it's it's not a product but a quotient. So and let's for this one, let's go from All right, so we'll just leave it like that. Okay, so we'll just do it improper like this. So, any ideas? Any ideas? Pull up 7 minus 9x to the fifth and raise it to the negative one half. Okay, so he wants to take that 7x to the minus fifth and write it as times the negative one half. Is it helpful? Why? Because now it looks like this, right? Yeah, so when you have a quotient, start by rewriting a quotient as a product. Start by rewriting the quotient as a product, and then we'll be it'll feel more comfortable. It'll feel like that. So, again, we're going to focus on f prime g. Is f prime g a or b? A or b is our f prime g. 
Okay, it's B, and how can we just do a quick check of that? The derivative of the inside should be the other thing, should be A, right? So what's the derivative of the inside? 0 minus 45 x to the 4th. Okay, so we got x to the 4th, x to the 4th. Does the 3 and the negative 45 phase us? Does it bother us? No. We know factors are easy to take care of. The key is the degree would have to be exactly the same. If that degree is not the same, then we can't undo the chain rule, right? It's got to be the same degree, but the factor we can take care of, no problem. So we're good to go. So what is the primary structure of this, right? And we're going to do the antiderivative. So what's the primary structure, or the, the exterior function for that right there? Is it e to the something? Is it ln of something? Is it something to the fifth? What is it? What's the overall exterior structure of this? That's what we need. We need the overall exterior, exterior structure to focus on to take the antiderivative of. It's power, right? What power? We have something to the negative one half. Antiderivative of something to the negative one half. Something to the half. What's something? No. Nope. What happens to g? Stays the same, right? No, we're not going to change that. G stays the same, right? So we have okay to the one half. Also two, right? Plus c. So what did I do? I just I identified what f the, the overall structure was, and I did the antiderivative. Overall structure was to the negative one half. Antiderivative then would be two times that thing to the one half. Did you did you catch it? Okay. So, what do we do? Take the derivative. So derivative is going to be seven minus nine x to the fifth to the negative one half times. Negative 45, x to the fourth. Is it identical to what we have? No. Okay, what do we have? So we have 3. In our first attempt, we got negative 45. So the question is, what do I have to do to my first attempt so that when we take the derivative of it, this is, ends up being positive 3 and not negative 45? And that will be our second attempt. So think about it. What do I have to do to the first attempt? So that derivative that I took would end up with positive 3 instead of negative 45. Andrew? He wants to divide by negative 15. Judith likes it. Okay. What if we're not sure? Well, thank you. What if we're not sure about our second attempt? Yeah, take the derivative again, and then compare that to the original, and you might need a third attempt. No big deal, right? We can handle it. But what do we think? Is it right? Yeah, we don't need. So we know that negative 45 divided by negative 15 would give us our 3. OK. Does it make sense? Anybody have a question? Can I erase this one? Okay, so let me give you another one here. And I'm going to make this... Um, maybe? Okay, I'm going to make this one um, proper just so we see one of those. So here we go. So we'll say from a negative 1 to 3. We 
Okay, you try. Go, you try. Oh, shit. David, did you get the first attempt? We're going to focus on A or B. Right, because remember, just think of chain rule, right? Think of chain rule. Chain rule is this. So which one of these two looks like our solution? First or second? So we have this, we're trying to recover the function that we had. So won't we focus on this one? This is a composite function. So which of these two is a composite function such that the interior function has its derivative elsewhere? A or B? B. Overall structure of that. Power. 
Yeah, yeah, right. So this derivative is if this derivative is basically one over that or to the negative one. How do we get? So if you use the power rule, this is going to become zero. zero, and it all goes away, and it evaporates. So what function has a derivative of one over or to the negative one? Natural log. So first attempt. Natural log of. Let's see. So, 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 okay, so what Connor's saying is when you do these enough, you begin to see what you can kind of get it right on the first attempt, if you can kind of see what's going to happen without going, writing it all down. When we take the derivative, we're also going to have a factor of 2. When we do the, when you do the chain rule, we're going to multiply by the e to the 2x, which is that but also times 2. So what do we need? 1 half. So when you start practicing and doing more and more of these, you can, you can try to do it all on the first attempt. Just go for it. And then still, take the derivative to check it. Okay, now this one is from negative 1 to 3. So it's the same thing. So we've got our, this represents all antiderivatives. So we're going to take it from negative 1 to 3. So it's going to be 1 half of Right, and so, and keep in mind, remember what this represents, right? So this is our accumulation function. So it's the total accumulation up to 3 minus the total accumulation up to negative 1 gives us the accumulation from negative 1 to 3 of the function that has that rate. Yeah, probably. What, what now? Oh, thanks. Do I have it now? Yes, sir. So because we're trying to find the accumulation between those two points, uh -huh. the c value really doesn't matter because it would be the same on both points. Yeah, so the accumulation would be it would be the same accumulation for any. So you could you can make this um, five or pi or zero or hundred, whatever or c. So yeah, so you can make it zero and just not include it. But it doesn't matter because it's yeah, it's the change in accumulation which at this rate will be the same no matter which accumulation function we have, right? Other questions? Yes, ma'am? Can you use those values, like the negative 1 or the mm -hmm. negative 3, to actually find out what the C is, though? I think on the last homework that we had that was due on Wednesday, we were using like the lower bound and putting it into one of those. No, it wasn't a, wasn't a bound. It gave us another piece of information. They said the accumulation, say, at 0 was 50. They gave us they gave us something like that. And that was what we used to find C. But it wasn't a bound. It wasn't like that? Okay. No, it wasn't a bound. So when you have actual bounds from one to the other, you don't need to solve for C. Because no matter which accumulation function you have, that accumulation from negative 1 to 3 will be the same if, if the rate's the same between those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but, but so you're, what you're remembering is you didn't have bounds, but you had some information about the accumulation function, and that allows you to solve for C. Right, that, right, so, exactly, so I, I could have put that in here, so, sorry, plus C here, that was our, that's our first, right, and then plus C. So, so here shows, right, algebraically, no matter what which accumulation function we have, or no matter which constant we're adding, because you're subtracting those, those will always subtract out. You see that? C minus C. So, when you actually have, you're doing a net accumulation from one to another, you can just call that C zero. Just make it zero. Okay. Other questions? Yes? This is right here? Yes. What did you get? Uh, 
It's not going to work because when you take the derivative of this, you'll get to the negative what? Always subtract one. Don't go closer to zero. Yeah, you don't go closer to zero, right? You truly subtract one no matter what that exponent is when you take the derivative. Are you good? Yeah. So yeah, sorry, that won't work. Other questions? Okay, so that's, um, like I said, so this, the my math lab regarding this will be due Wednesday. Um, we have lots of practice, and we've already done, like, four of them, okay? So, last chance, questions. Okay, so let's, we talked briefly after we got done with the first half talking about getting accumulation from rate. We, we talked briefly about this, so, um, but I want to go a little more, more in depth. So, this should be a familiar looking uh, illustration here. We've got a rate of change function on the left. And corresponding accumulation on the right. So what does what are the blue what's the blue function relative to that rate of change function? What's the blue function? Okay, I heard someone say step function and Beth, what is it? Yeah, it's the approximate rate of change. And we why, do you remember why we made the approximate rate of change function, that blue step function? To have constant rates so that we could. It made the math easy to add up bits of change, right? Because we could just use k the rate times delta x, rate times delta x, and just add those up and get and build our accumulation function that way. Okay, so this is kind of showing that. So we've got um, rate number one times delta x gave that little amount of accumulation, and then rate number two times delta x gave that bit of accumulation. So here at whatever 4.2 or 4.1. We're going to sum up all the little bits of accumulation to get this y value, which is the accumulation at whatever, 4.2, 4.1. Okay, so now here's an alternate way to look at it. Notice over here the rate is represented by, do you see this represented by this distance right here? rate number one. Okay, and what about delta x? Horizontal distance, right? So this is our delta x, and this distance right here is the rate. So by multiplying the rate times delta x, kind of incidentally because of rectangular coordinates, what does that kind of also equal. Remember what we talked about? That rectangle, right? So the area is not the meaning of it, right? What's the meaning of r times delta x? What's the meaning of r times delta x? What's that? Stanley? Change in y. Change in y, OK? A little bit of accumulation, right? That's the meaning of it. But because we're in rectangular coordinates, and it happens that rate is the vertical distance and delta x is the horizontal distance, it also happens that that value equals the area of that rectangle. But it's not the meaning of it. You know, the meaning is a little bit of accumulation. Okay? So we can kind of stack up these rectangles, each one of those little bits of accumulation. It's like the area of a rectangle. Okay, so here's a note that integration is remotely related to areas of rectangles is entirely an artifact that we're graphing in rectangular coordinates. Okay, it's not a deep mathematical principle. Okay? We, so we know the meaning of these little r delta x's. It's not, they're not areas, right? They're not areas. Bits of accumulation, exactly. So, so of whatever quantity we're talking about, right? So if it's um, the rate is rate of change of weight, then bits of weight, right? Little bits of weight accumulating.
Okay, so what happens when our delta x is smaller? Skinnier rectangles whose tops are matching the curve better, right? The tops of those rectangles, that's our, the tops of those rectangles, that's our approximating ray function, right? And so we know with more skinnier rectangles, it's kind of going to um, approximate the, that ray function better. So as delta x gets very, very small, what is the sum of these rectangles getting close to? As delta x gets very, very small, the sum of these rectangles? Exact accumulation, but what about in terms of this new geometric representation? Yeah, so as delta x gets very, very, very small, and those rectangles get very, very, very thin, we get this, um, that the sum, the total accumulation is uh, can be represented by the area under the curve. Okay, but it's that's a superficial way to think of it. Okay. All right. So let's look at this. Here's a here's a function g of x, and we want to look at um, from negative point five to four. Okay, from negative point five to four. So there's a negative point five here. Oops. Okay, so this question asks, find the net area bounded by the graph of G, the x-axis, x equals negative 0.5 and x equals 4. So if we're doing that, then what does that kind of imply about the function G? What kind of function is G if we're talking about finding the net area bounded by the curve? What does that, so that we should say, oh, then G is like what kind of function? They're saying rate of change. Agree with that? Rate of change or accumulation? G. What do you think? Remember the previous slide? Those rectangles, right? Right. Setting up those rectangles that eventually become the area under the curve. What kind of function? Rate of change, right? Rate of change. It makes sense that because the tops of those rectangles is what we did as our step function, our approximating step function for the rate. Okay? So the first thing we do is if we're asked this question, we kind of think, oh, it's kind of like G is a rate function. But if we're, in, if we're just talking about area, then it kind of doesn't matter. All right? But, but we relate that question to, oh, G is a rate function. So this idea of net area, so what, tell me about the accumulation here from, say, 0.5 to 2.5. What can you tell me about the accumulation? Accumulation is decreasing. Is the accumulation negative? Yeah, what if, it, what if we started at 100,000 here, right? Okay, so, um, but the cum is accumulation decreasing here? Yeah, because the rate, the rate is negative. We know when the rate is negative, accumulation is going down. Okay, so this idea of net area, so, so as we're adding areas across here, what's going to be the effect of... Suppose we did this integral here from negative 0.5 to 4 of g of x. In terms of the accumulation from negative 0.5 to 4, can you, can you kind of break that, based on this graph of g, can you kind of break that down and explain what is going to happen with that accumulation? Yeah. Tell me. I don't know. So from 0.5 all the way over Oh, negative 0.5? Yeah. Okay, yeah, then we can go from negative 0.5 to right there. Yeah. Um, it's going to be increasing. Accumulation is increasing. At a slower rate, so it's approaching like a flat point. Okay. And then it goes to a negative accumulation. It's going to be more negative all the way over to right, so we get to slow down there. 
And now what's, what's happening here? It switches to decreasing. It switches to decreasing. Yeah. So accumulation is going down. down. All the way to 3 or 2.7. Right. When it starts to increase again. Now the accumulation is increasing again. So we're going to have, the, this is the idea of a net effect. The net effect is that our, our quantity was growing, but then it was receding, and then it was growing again. So how does that work out with the areas, right? So so the integral from here to here would be what kind of value? Positive, right? Accumulation is going up. Then here? Negative, because the accumulation is going down, and then positive again. So what, what will this integral find? Will it find the sum total of those three areas? Will it find the sum total of those three areas? Daniel. It's going to be subtracting the blue part when it's still area. He says it's going to be subtracting the blue part. It's a negative sum total. I'm asking what this integral is going to do related to this area. What is that integral going to do related to this area? Is it going to add in the blue area or is it going to subtract it? It's subtracted, but it's adding in negative numbers. Right, right. The rate is negative. Yeah. So, so this, but area is always positive. So this blue area as a positive value is subtracted when you think about this calculation. Does it make sense? Because positive accumulation going up. Well, then the accumulation recedes because the negative rate, right? Negative rate. And then we add back in again. So that right there is going to find, so we already wrote that, but it's going to find this area plus this area minus this one, minus this one automatically. Because it's summing up, when that G is negative, it's going to be subtracting the theories of those rectangles. So different function, same question. Find the net area bounded by the graph of f from negative 0.5 to 4. And explain, okay, explain what that will be like in terms of these areas. So go. So, so write, write an expression that will find the net area and then kind of reason it, reason it out. Okay? Reason it out with the person next to you. Here's our negative 0.5. Here's 4. Okay, so we still we still want the net area, and I've I've written three areas up here: a one, a two, and a three. And consider those as just as areas, all as positive. Okay. Consider them all as positive. What would be the net area for this situation? How would you? So you can either tell me in terms of these these a's, or you can use um, calculus to tell me what is the net area. So let's see. Daniel, any idea? Uh, you can use the integral. Integral. Will that get me the net area from negative 0.5 to 4? Dx, thank you. Yes. Very important. Now it will. 
Okay? How about Andrew in the back? How can we write what that will calculate in terms of these positive areas, A1, A2, and A3? So if we consider all those to be positive areas, how can we use those symbols, A1, A2, and A3, to write what that equals? A1 and A3 are negative, so we need to subtract them. That's what, that's what you're saying. Someone had their hand up. Is that what you're going to say? Same thing? Agree, Judith? Um, I made mine a little different, but I think that the math still follows. Okay. I mean, A2 minus, and then open parentheses, A1 plus A3. Uh -huh. Yep. That works? Yeah, you're going to add the two that are below together and subtract it all as a lump. Yep, totally. Okay, does it make sense? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because we don't need to, because we can we can get it in just one. So, so uh, it's it's basically a, we're really analyzing what if we didn't do three integrals, if we just did one integral, what is it calculating? That's what that's what we're really getting at here. What exactly is it calculating? Every time the rate of change is positive, what kind of contribution to the accumulation? Positive accumulation to the to you know increase in accumulation. Every time the rate of change is negative. What contribution do we have to our accumulation? A negative, a negative contribution. All right. So if we're talking about areas, then wherever it's below, those areas are subtracted out, and wherever it's above, those are added in. Does it make sense? Okay. So here's the real question. And you're up for the challenge. Find the total area bounded by the graph of G, the x-axis, and negative 0.5 and 4. We want total area now. Total area. Go. Total area. Use calculus to express the total area between the curve and the x-axis. Are you asking for like, the number or for what we do? Like you want us to go? No, no, no. Just the expression. Okay. Express it. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to do the antiderivative, and we want to. We'd have to multiply it out first, and that would be. Yeah. So write an expression for the total area. Sure, sure. Point one three. Two point eight one and four. Yeah. So in terms of A one, A two, and A three, not calculus, but in terms of A two, A one, A two, and A three, what are we asking for here? Add them all together. Okay? Keep going. Okay, yeah, you can do that. That's that's one way to do it. How could you do it? So yeah, that's good. How could you do it without absolute value also? So think about that. I 
Okay, Chelsea, idea? Well, that would be the net area. So now we're asking for total area. So we're asking for A1 plus A2 plus A3. So how can we use calculus or some kind of math expression to represent adding up those three areas? Talia, did you get it? How do we mark this thing value? Okay. So that's fine. That's that's one way to do it. So tell me. Um, the integral from negative point five to point one three. I that. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So in, so you're going to break it up into three integrals. Yes. So rather than using absolute value for this, what can we do? So, okay, let's just, that's fine, let's go, so, Talia, sorry, let's go 0.13 to what? 2.81 of? Okay, sorry. Alright, and then? Okay, does it work? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, is there an alternate way? So the fact that we're breaking it at 0.13 and 2.81 is we're forcing this where it's always negative, right? So is there an alternate way to do that middle integral? Okay. But so, all right, but we want to go from left to right. We want to go from left to right. Tyler. Okay, yep, that's okay. But so sticking with this idea of adding three integrals together. Judith. Um, if you're worried about absolute valuing the second one because it's going to come out negative, can't you just subtract it because the negatives will multiply together and get a plus? Yeah, so the whole point was going from 0.13 to 2.81 was isolating exactly where the rate function was negative. negative. So what do we want it to be? To, yeah, so if we don't want to, to subtract that area, we want it to add. So we can just... Subtract that integral, right? So we want to, we want to add where it's positive, and then we want to subtract where it's negative because that... May, may ends up adding it, right? Plus. So plus minus the integral from 0.13 to 2.81 plus the integral from 2.81 to 4. So here's some fancy graphics to show that. <laughs> so we're going to integrate. So that negative 0.5 to x, but then we want the opposite of the integral from x1 to x2. And then there you go. I can't take credit for it. Okay, and then so someone had, was it Tyler? Did you have an alternate way to do this? Does it work? So no matter so no matter what g value we have, it's always going to be positive. And so then think about all those air, all those rectangles are going to they're all going to be up. So the absolute value, what well, looks like this it looks like this, and then and then does that mirror image, and then it does that. So that's the absolute value of g. And if we, we can integrate all the way across, it'll do exactly what we want, add up the three areas. So 
Either way, you should understand it both ways. Under, make sure you understand that. And then also this. Questions? Okay, very important recitation today. Oh, and if you can uh, bring it's graph and calculator, so that, that worksheet involves using graph and calculator to check things and look at graphs, and so bring graph and calculator as you're doing that. Okay, this is good stuff. Home stretch. He doesn't, and it's just genius.